welcome to South Fair Craftsmanship McHenry County. This is actually our 10 year anniversary. So that's a big, big milestone for us. Um, mm -hmm. We started, um, our first meeting was at Follett 10 years ago to this day and the topic was HTML5. Um, we actually started about two years before that as a different user group. Uh, the, the topic was cloud development. Um, so we met at like Panera, at the Crystal Lake Public Library, like a bunch of kind of just ad hoc places. And um, when Follett started sponsoring us with the, the location that really helped us as a group. Um, and at that point, we were kind of like through, and you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't as much to the clouds. So we kind of got through a lot of those topics and we were like, you know, let's, let's really expand um, the focus a bit of this group. And really this group is about, you know, um, growing the local software development community and growing ourselves in our careers. Um, so I do want to mention, uh, well, I've already mentioned Follett as a sponsor, but another one of our sponsors is the LaSalle Network. And um, they are a recruiting firm. So if you're interested in that, I can get you connected with them. Um, also for our November meeting, we do have a spot for a speaker. So if you are interested in that contact myself or Michael Buscelli. Um, and then also I did wanna mention, we do have a Slack channel. So if you wanna kind of stay in touch with this community throughout the month, um, send, you can um, request an invite through that or just reach out to you know one of the organizers and we can get you added to that. Um, also, as I mentioned before I started the recording, we have a YouTube channel so you can see past um, presentations there and this will probably be posted there it usually takes a week or two for that video editing to be done but um, just a heads up on that and yeah so um, quick intro for Bob so um, he is an important figure obviously in our industry he's an agile manifesto uh, signer uh, he was involved in a lot of the you know early software craftsmanship uh, movement and he's been a supporter of this group. Um, so he's this is actually his third time speaking live with this group, which is great. And we've also watched some of his videos, his cleancoders.com videos. Um, so you know we we've, we've seen from him over the years. So if you are interested in uh, in those videos, you can go to cleancoders.com and they are available for purchase. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bob. Well, thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Good to be here, wherever here is. Um, now, lately, I've been doing an awful lot of these Zoom things. So, okay, <laughs> here, here we all are in this era of COVID. I'm going to um, share my screen. Uh, let's see, my host has disabled attendee screen sharing. So you're going to have to make me a co-host or something, I think. All right, sorry about that. No problem. All right, try it again. And there we go. Goody, goody, goody. And that's the one I want right there. Good. All right, so the future of programming. This is a talk that I have done many times and in many places. Uh, and it's it's mostly just for fun, although there's a little bit of a uh, a lesson and a moral involved. But most of it is just a review of the past of our industry and maybe a small projection into what may be coming. The, um, the time span is from the 1940s up till now. Uh, we begin in fact with uh, Alan Turing in 1936, so I might as well just go there. Uh, if you haven't read this paper, it's, it's actually worth reading. And it's worth reading in a book that was written by Charles Petzold. I'm going to find that book and hold it up for you. And uh, you can see it on my uh, screen. Let's see if I've got it here. Is that the Turing machine? It is called the Annotated Turing. And it's written by Charles Petzold. And I know I've got it here, but I'm looking on my bookshelf and I must have stuck it in an in a, a place where it's not immediately obvious. Well, that's the name of it, The Annotated Turing by Charles Petzold. And you may remember the name, Charles Petzold. He's the guy who wrote 
all the old uh, Microsoft Foundation classes books in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then he stopped writing that kind of software pornography and started writing some serious stuff. And, and this book is, I think, is his masterpiece. It's a it's an extremely well-written book. He republishes all of Turing's paper word for word, but he does so uh, almost sentence by sentence and then surrounds each sentence with all of the historical context and all of the necessary explanation. So it's a fascinating read. I've read it twice. I'll probably read it a third time. It's it's very, very interesting and, and entertaining and also educational. And, you know, 1936, Turing invents this machine, which is not really even a machine. It's just a an infinitely long paper tape with a window that a, a human operator can slide back and forth one cell at a time. And, and the human operator is given a set of instructions that amount to a, a very simple finite state machine or, or maybe a very complicated finite state machine, but, all, but very, very simple to follow these instructions. And given that, he writes a whole bunch of code. And, and it's code, it's, it's real code. He, he has to invent things like subroutines and macros and, and constants and all of the stuff that we would normally think of as belonging to uh, a computer program. The, the language itself is a little bit odd, but then he, he, he takes it to these very interesting extremes. He finds a way to encode the human instructions into a numerical form and then he writes a program for the Turing machine, which will of course be executed by a human, that will take the number that is a program and execute it. So in, in essence, he builds a Turing machine, machine simulator in a Turing machine, uh, and then goes on to prove that uh, there are certain programs that can't be written. It's a, it's a remarkable uh, work. In any case, that's 1936. And in some sense, that is the start of our industry. Now, now, we could go back further. We could go back to Charles Babbage and the analytical engine, which, of course, was never built. And we could go all the way back to, to the Ada, you know, Ada, the Countess of Lovelace, the, the daughter of Lord Byron, the, the, the famous British poet who wrote Don Juan. And we could, uh, we could talk about her. She, she did write some algorithms uh, on this machine, which of course was never built. And the machine itself was a programmable machine. It was not exactly a stored program machine. The instructions were held on um, punched cards, sort of, although they were blocks of wood with holes drilled in them. Uh, but, but it did have arithmetic operations and logical operations and conditional operations and branches. So in, in, in that, in that sense, it was a, um, a programmable computer. And she did write some algorithms for it. The thing that we credit her with is that she was the first person to realize that a machine that manipulates numbers can manipulate any kind of symbol at all, including music and words and so forth. So she, she was the first person to have that insight that we know of. And for that reason, we call her the first programmer. The person who actually wrote the first code that executed on an electronic machine, though, was probably Alan Turing. There's some doubt about that. There's other competitors for that slot. But let's just say that it was Turing, who was the very first electronic computer programmer. Of course, he didn't start with electronic computers. He started with electromechanical computers when he was you know, helping to win World War II by breaking the Enigma codes, uh, the German codes that, <laughs> that were uh, confounding the Americans and the British uh, in the North Atlantic. And he, he eventually came up with a search engine, which is what that machine was, the, the big bomb machine. They called it a bomb for some reason. Um, was a huge search engine that could search through different possibilities of of uh, code solutions to try and find the ones that would would make uh, would match the best, and the uh, the components in that machine were all relays, relays and and uh, rotary motors and things like that that were all common elements in the telephone system, and the telegraphy system. Uh, relay, you, you can see a relay there. It's a simple device. It's 
got an electromagnetic coil. If you run a current through that coil, it makes that, that piece of metal a magnet, which attracts that little lever arm. And the little lever arm then moves those contacts down there at the bottom. And it'll open certain contacts and close other contacts. And that's a relay. That's how a relay works. And it's called a relay because it was used to relay telegraphy signals down the, the long telegraph wires. And it's not hard to imagine why that worked. It, if, you, uh, if you tried to hook up a battery to a wire and send telegraphy signals down a long wire, you might get it to go a mile or two or three miles, but the resistance of the wire would eventually build up to the point where you, you couldn't energize the, the, uh, the receiving coil. So they would put relays in every couple of miles and power them with their own batteries. You know, you push a key down on a telegraph key and it would close the relay a mile down and that would close a contact that would energize the next one down the line. And you'd get this lovely little ripple effect down the line until it finally got to the receiving station. Now, you know, a little, a little device like that can maybe operate at 10 cycles a second, maybe 20 cycles a second, depends on how big they are, but, but that was faster than humans. So it was, it was an effective means of doing computation. Now, what they would have liked to have had was vacuum tubes. And in fact, they did try to build uh, a, a similar machine out of vacuum tubes. They called it a Colossus. I think they did eventually get it to work. The problem with vacuum tubes though in those days was that they were not man mass produced. They, they did not have consistent quality. They were power hungry. Those filaments ate up watts. All right, and they were expensive and they were fragile and they broke a lot. And it was very difficult to get more than a few of them working together at any given time. So although by the end of World War II, probably too late to actually help with the breaking of the codes, they did get something of a vacuum tube computer working. Uh, it was relays that really did the hard work. But they kept at the vacuum tubes. And by 1945, by, by the end of the war, they actually had a machine after the war was over. They had a machine that was an electronic computer, the automated computing engine, the ACE. And Alan Turing was, was intimately involved with this. He helped to design it. He helped to design the instruction set. And it was a, a fascinating machine. You'd, you'd imagine that it would, it would operate, you know, 10,000 operations a second or something like that. Uh, many, many, many tubes. And of course the tubes would fail all the time. It had to have some memory and they, and they set it out to have 1024 22-bit words. Because, you know, nobody knew what a byte was. Nobody had even thought of a byte in those days. But they did understand binary. And so this was going to have 1024, 22-bit uh, words. Why 22-bit words? That was just the way they designed their, their instructions. The memory itself was mercury delay lines. A mercury delay line, you see a bunch of them here. It's a tube full of mercury with a speaker on one end and a microphone on the other. And you pumped your bits into the speaker and sound waves would move through the mercury at very fast speed because the speed of sound in mercury at room temperature is pretty high. And then a microphone would pick that up at the far end and then they would electronically feed that back to the speaker. So this was rotating memory, <laughs> sort of like a disc or a drum, except it was sound waves in mercury. I actually worked on a, uh, a programmable calculator in the late 60s that used a similar technique to store data, but it wasn't mercury, it was, it was solid steel wires. And they would pump acoustical signals into those solid steel wires and pick them up at the other end. These wires were no longer than maybe a foot, <laughs> but they could still hold a, a, a reasonable amount of bits in them. And then of course they'd cycle them around the same way. These guys tried to get the mercury delay lines working, but they had a problem. They were very sensitive to vibration. And, you know, they, they had this installed in Manchester. And anytime a truck went by on the road, it would shake the mercury and destroy all the bits. So eventually they used a different technique, which was cathode ray tube memory. Now, some of us on this call are old enough to remember what a cathode ray tube actually is, and some of us maybe aren't. Cathode ray tube is a television screen, the old style television. Remember the one when you turned it off and the pictures kind of slowly collapsed into a dot on the screen? That was a vacuum tube. It had a filament at the back end. It spit 
electrons forward. Those electrons were controlled by a set of coils and plates and a beam would be moved back and forth across the screen. And the thing about that beam is that it would deposit a charge on the screen that could be detected by the next sweep of the electron beam. You could detect how much current was in that beam. And if there was some charge deposited, it would either attract or repel that current. So you could actually, with a good amplifier, you could see the bits that you had last written. And so uh, they used this as their form of memory. And they actually got this to work pretty well. And it had a side benefit because there were phosphors on that screen that would light up when the electrons hit it. And so you could actually see the memory. <laughs> this, this was actually Alan Turing's output device. He read a number of the results of his, of his programs off of that screen by actually looking at memory in, in a very real sense. He was looking at memory. He, um, he organized, in his mind, he organized the binary into five-bit sequences. So he worked in base 32. The rest of us, of course, eventually opted for either octal or hexadecimal. But he wanted base 32. So that's what he was working in. And on this machine, he wrote a bunch of programs. Now, the kind of programs he wrote, I mean, first of all, he had to write them all in binary, right? There were no languages. <laughs> there weren't even any assemblers. Right, he literally had to write them in binary, punch them on paper tape, and and get them loaded in some kind of five-channel paper tape reader. Which you know you can imagine how horrible that was. And here's this machine which had nothing more than an integer add. It didn't even have a subtract. And and with that, he had to invent subtraction and multiplication and division. He had to invent a floating point package. If you've ever written a floating point package, you know just how difficult that is. And, and if you never have written a floating point package, it's a reasonable thing to do on a weekend. You know, send all the kids away, send the wife and, and the, the significant others away and go for a, a deep geeky dive into the basement and write yourself a floating point package using nothing but integers and, and figure out how to do, you know, the addition of floating point numbers and the multiplication and the division of floating point numbers with the exponents and the mantissa and all that stuff. It's a, a fascinating thing to do. <laughs> and, and he had to do it all in binary, of course. They built this machine. They had not anticipated that anybody would want to call a subroutine. The very idea of a subroutine really hadn't occurred to them, although you see hints of it in Turing's 1936 paper. Even so, there was no way for them to conveniently store a return address. So Turing had to invent that idea and figure out a way to get those the, that a return address saved somewhere. He invents the concept of a stack. And instead of using push and pop, he calls them uh, uh, bury and unbury, which, which is a strange notation. In any case, he does all of this stuff. He works for a year coding on this unreliable, slow, fragile, persnickety machine. And at the end, he gives a lecture. About a year later, he gives a lecture. And that lecture was transcribed. Somebody wrote it down. And uh, reading it is like reading a little bit of Nostradamus. Because here's, here's a passage, right? <laughs> and, it's, and it's remarkable. We shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability, <laughs> because there will probably be a good deal of work of this kind to be done. Now, now I don't think Turing had any idea just how right he was about that, but it's it's remarkable just to see him say that in 1940, it was actually 1946 when he said that. And I love his characterization of a programmer. A programmer is a mathematician not just a run-of-the-mill mathematician, a mathematician of ability. <laughs> and, and, and we're going to need a lot of them because, boy, oh, boy, are we going to have a lot of this kind of work to, be, to do. He goes on, and, and this is even better, right? He goes on and he says, one of our difficulties will be the maintenance of appropriate discipline <laughs> so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. Now that sounds like the voice of experience if I've ever heard it, but what a lovely prescient statement to have made, right? One of our difficulties will be the maintenance of appropriate discipline. We're still working on that one. 
still working on trying to figure out what kind of disciplines we ought to have and how to maintain those disciplines. And we still lose track of what we're doing. So I find that just to be a, a remarkable set of statements made by a man who wrote code for a year in the most primitive possible of situations and then realizes what the future is going to look like. But now let's actually walk into that future. Let's take a, a slow stroll from that moment in time forward towards today. And we'll begin right then in 1945. The number of computers in the world is one or I'll use big O notation here, it's on the order of one. Because although the ACE was probably the first electronic computer, uh, within a few months, there were a bunch of others. And the number of programmers in the world was on the order of one. And it's remarkable, I think, that within one person's lifetime, <laughs> There were no programmers, and now there are so many. And that's in 70, what, 70, what, four years? 75 years? In 75 years, less than the, the span of a man's life, we went from no programmers to how many do we have now? <laughs> how many programmers are there right now? I mean, I think it's on the order of about 100 million. I don't know that for a fact, but... You think of all the VBA programmers out there, and yeah, I think there's probably 100 million of them. Anyway, this is the moment, 1945, where we went from zero to non-zero, so on the order of one. But things were changing fast. That memory situation wasn't going to hold on for long. Core memory was invented very rapidly. I imagine some of you out there have used machines <laughs> that had core. The, the pictures you're seeing here are, are actually pictures I took. I own that particular core plane. It's sitting up on my counter up there uh, in a little box where I keep it as a little memento of, of the past. And the, uh, the, the close-up picture I took with a little microscope. And if you don't know what core memory is, core memory is made up of those little rings. And those little rings, <laughs> those, those little rings um, are made of ferrite. Ferrite is powdered iron mixed with clay. And you form it into a ring and then you fire it in a kiln and it, and it maintains good magnetic properties. And then you weave those wires through it and the idea is that if you run a, an appropriate amount of current through the core, it will uh, magnetize the core. And if you run the current the opposite direction, it will magnetize the core in the opposite sense. So north, south, or south, north. Now, it turns out that there's a characteristic of ferrite that if you don't run the sufficient current through it, it will maintain its current polarity. It will not lose its magnetism, it will hold on to it. So in that sense, it's a memory cell. And every ring was in fact a bit. Now you see the way the grid is organized. It's got this lattice. So you could run half the necessary current through the horizontal line and half the necessary current through the vertical line and that would magnetize one cell. That was how you could magnetize one core. If you wanted to read a core, then what you did is you ran the current through that core that would force it to the zero state, whatever state that was. If it was already zero, then the core didn't change. If the core was in the one state, however, it would flip. And in the process of flipping, it would induce a current in another one of the wires going through those cores there. And with the appropriate kind of amplifier and just the right timing, you could see the current induced and that's how you would read the core. And then of course, you'd have to write the data back. So it was, it was a destructive read. So you would read the data out and then you'd write it back, the two cycle operation. Now I, I put that up there and I give you some idea of how it works because I want you to understand just how expensive these things were. First of all, those little rings are about a millimeter in diameter. They're really, really small. And second of all, there was no machine that could build a core plane like that. Oh, there were looms 
but they had to be manned by humans and it would be the humans, <laughs> you know, that were making sure that the wires went through all those cores. So they were horribly expensive things to build. You know, at, at, at the early days, they were well more than a dollar per bit. And you know, nowadays, you know, nowadays we walk around with, you know, terabytes in our pocket and we, you know, we think it's not enough, you know, trillions of dollars worth of memory in 1950s. But that's what, that's what memory was. And, and because of the cost, computers were necessarily um, small from a memory point of view. They didn't have a lot of memory in them. I remember working on a, a machine with 4K. You see that little blinky box behind me? That's a, uh, a mock-up of a PDP-8 with 4K. 4K, we figured that was a lot of memory. But now we're into the 1950s, right? And, and the mass production of vacuum tubes had really begun. You know, people were buying radios and even television sets. And there were tubes coming out everywhere. And they're getting mass produced. And they were getting reliable and small and low power. And the idea that you could build a functioning, reliable computer and many such computers out of, out of such tubes became a reality. This was a fascinating era, right? The machines that were developed during this time were big and expensive. And I mean expensive. They were tens of millions of dollars in 1950s dollars. These were not something to sneeze at. If you had a computer, you were a wealthy son of a gun. You, you, were, you were a big company is what you were. You were a, a research firm or a weapons lab or a weather lab or something like that. There weren't a lot of these machines made. I'll tell you how many were made a little bit later, but I want to show you what was happening in the software world, because this is the era of Fortran. Fortran was invented in 1953. Now think about that. That's what? Um, eight years, eight years after Turing wrote his first binary code on that little stupid computer, that ACE. Eight years later, John Bacchus has submitted the, uh, the Fortran spec. And, and I don't know if any of you ever wrote any Fortran. I did. I wrote some Fortran. Lovely little language, extremely primitive. If you look down there, look at line 704. That's a good line to look at. That's an, a Fortran if statement. And in the parentheses, and by the way, you can see where our language syntax came from early, early on. <laughs> so in the parentheses, you see uh, IA plus IC minus IB. Now, the reason they all begin with I is because any variable that began with the letter I was an integer. And in fact, it was I through N, I, J, K, L, M, N. Those letters were integers. Everything else was a real number, a floating point number. Uh, and and in, in Fortran, you did not mix modes. If, if you had an expression, it was either an integer expression or a real expression. You could not mix modes. That was against the world. We had strong static typing in Fortran. To, well, sort of anyway. So that line 704 inside the parentheses, you would evaluate that expression. And then you see those three numbers? <laughs> so if, if, the, uh, if the value of the expression was negative, it would jump to that first 777. Now you'll see 777 down there. That's, that's line 777 where that stop instruction is. So that would actually halt the computer. <laughs> they didn't have operating systems in those days, right? It didn't return to the operating system. It halted the computer. <laughs> if, if the value of the expression was zero, it would also halt the computer. It would go to 777. But if the value of the expression was positive, it would go to line 705. <laughs> now, you look at the line numbers off to the edge there, and you think, well, why are they using line numbers? Look at the line numbers, by the way. You'll notice that they're not ordinal. <laughs> They don't come in order. Most of them appear to be in order, but if you look down low enough, you'll see 601, which comes after 799. And in fact, those numbers were not ordinal. You could put them in any order you wanted. They were, they were nothing more than labels. And you might ask the question, well, why? Why didn't they use textual labels then? That would make a lot more sense than numbers. And the answer there is memory was expensive. Storing a bunch of characters took more, more memory than storing one number. <laughs> so, so the language itself tells us that memory was expensive. Some of you out there probably worked on uh, punch cards. Uh, maybe some of you did. Maybe some of you didn't. I don't know. Uh, I certainly started with punch cards. 
And uh, you see that green and white thing down at the bottom? That's a coding form. Programmers at these t in these days did not know how to type. They did not know how to use a keyboard. None of the programmers I ever worked with knew how, except the ones my age, <laughs> knew how to use a keyboard. They all wrote their code with number two pencils in the squares of those coding forms. And they would spend all day writing their code, carefully checking it, looking it over again and again. They'd write a dozen pages or so. And then they would take those pages down the hall to the key punch operator. And the key punch operator who hated the programmers because they gave them more work to do would punch those cards. And it would take them a day or so. You'd go back a day later and you'd get your, your deck of cards. And then you'd look through your cards to make sure they had been punched correctly. You see that little picture of a punch card up there? You see the, uh, the dot matrix printing at the very top edge? That's where you would read your code. You'd thumb through the deck, read your code. And then uh, if you were satisfied, <laughs> you would then take your deck with a rubber band around it and you would take it down the hall to the computer room. Programmers were not allowed into the computer room. Programmers were not allowed to touch the computer. Only the operators could touch the computer. So you would stand outside the operation, operator door. You would stand outside the door of the computer room. And you would, um, you would ask, you would beg the operators, to take your deck, you want to get it compiled. You would beg them to take your deck. You would make the necessary gestures of obeisance outside the operator's door, and then and then they might take you know open the door, and this big hairy burly arm would come out and take your deck into the bowels of the computer room where it would sit for oh hours. You know they wouldn't run the compile until three in the morning because those operators had real work to do, and that machine was a multi million dollar machine. They had to keep it running you know, 24 seven, it had to be running. So maybe at three in the morning after all the batch jobs were done, then they would, you know, stick your compile in the reader and hit the read button. Then, you know, all the programmers compiles would be done at that time. And then the operators would tear off the listings and put them on a table. And you'd come back the next day, take your listing to your desk, open it up and realize that you'd forgotten the comma. This was the life of a programmer in those days. It was, uh, I, I came into programming at the tail end of that period and quickly taught myself to type and quickly got on a mini computer where I had, I could actually touch the computer and that was a much better way of working. This was a fascinating era. This is when Lisp was invented. Lisp was invented in 1958. I mean, the very first Lisp code ran on these vacuum tube machines. These were, uh, interesting days. And the kinds of computers were these. These were uh, uh, IBM 703 and 709 computers, uh, vacuum tube machines, hideously expensive. They made 140 of the doggone things, right? Now, and, you know, they were expensive enough that, okay, if you make 140 of them, you're still making a heck of a good profit. They did not sell these machines. IBM would lease the machines to you. And, you know, the companies who bought them or the laboratories who leased them uh, would pay a lot of money to have these machines installed at their uh, sites. They pay, you know, on a monthly basis, they pay 10,000 a month or 50,000 a month or 100,000 a month just to keep them around because these machines were big, horrible, ugly machines, very low power from our point of view. They couldn't do very much from our point of view, but okay. I mean, that's that, those were the machines. And now we've, we've moved forward in time by 15 years, let's say. It's now 1960. How many computers are there in the world? Well, on the order of 100, maybe, maybe 500, maybe 600, something like that. You know, it's big O notation, so we can, we can, <laughs> we can weasel about it a little bit. But, but probably not in the thousands yet. Computers are still big, expensive. There are not very many of them. How many programmers are there? Ah, maybe about 10 times as many. Because you see in those days, it took 10 programmers to keep one machine running. And this was before there were operating systems. It was before there were frameworks. It was before there were libraries that you could download. Download, what the hell is download, right? <laughs> so if it ran on your computer, it's because you wrote the code. Every instruction in that computer was something you wrote. You and your pro team of programmers wrote everything in that machine. <laughs> 
That was during the days when you dominated the machine. Who were these programmers? Who were these thousands of programmers? You couldn't go to school to become a programmer. There were no uh, uh, degree programs. <laughs> you, had to, you had to learn how to do it on the job. You had to read the manuals, and the manuals were not written by guys who were good at writing. You know, these were engineers who cobbled together these manuals. So, so this was not easy stuff. And the companies that had these computers, the laboratories and the companies and the organizations that had them, drew programmers from their best, right? The engineers, the scientists, the mathematicians of ability, the people that, that the companies and the labs trusted the most would become the programmers. And these were people who were old. They weren't young. They were old. They'd been around a while. These were people in their high 30s or 40s or 50s who had been around. They understood the problems. They understood the business. They understood projects and, and management. They understood all that stuff. Right? So, so the early programmers you know, were the old guys. But things were changing fast. The transistor had been invented and the transistor was like a tiny little vacuum tube, except that it didn't draw any power, right? And it was dirt cheap and it was reliable as hell and very, very small. And the size and the cost of computers began to fall. The first hints of Moore's law began to assert themselves in the early 60s. IBM took advantage of this right away by 1965 they had produced 10,000 1401 computers. These were lovely machines. These were sold to businesses. This was a business machine produced by international business machines, IBM, right? It was so much of a business machine that all of the math inside it was done in decimal. They knew binary, they understood binary, and, and deep down inside, it was still bits but all of the math was done in binary coded decimal. It was all done in decimal digits. It was such a decimal machine that it shipped with 4,000 words of memory, not 4096, 4,000 words of memory. And by the way, they were real bytes. They were bytes of memory. By this time, the byte had been invented. IBM understood that you wanted to uh, store characters in memory. <laughs> so, so the byte was done. Now, again, you didn't buy these things. You rented them and you rented them for like $2,500 a month. But that was in the range of a whole bunch of companies. Lots and lots of companies could could get these 1401s and put them on their site. Other companies would, would get a 1401 and then offer services to other companies. We will run your programs for you. I, my first job was at a client service bureau like that, where they we had the computers on our site and we ran programs for a whole bunch of other companies. The number of computers has grown enormously in just five years. Now we'd have to say it's, you know, big O of, of 10,000. <laughs> so, so the number of computers has been has multiplied by probably two orders of magnitude in just those five years. And the number of programmers, well, it still takes 10 programmers to keep one machine working, right? So probably now there are hundreds of thousands of programmers. It's only 1965. It's only 20 years since touring. And it's there are probably hundreds of thousands of programmers in the world. And who are these programmers? <laughs> you know, we've only gone 20 years. By the way, I'm 13, you know, so <laughs> I'm alive at this point. I've actually written my first line of code by this time because I wrote my first line of code when I was 12. <laughs> but, but who were these programmers? Because there weren't enough engineers and scientists and mathematicians of ability. And there were still no graduates, right? You still couldn't, couldn't take a course on computer science in college. So businesses had a problem. They needed programmers, but they didn't know where to get them. This was the era of the aptitude test. <laughs> Companies would design these aptitude tests to find the employees that had the aptitude for programming. This was a terrible idea that the aptitude tests were awful, but this is, this is how they did their recruiting. And they would scan their entire employment base to try and find people who worked for them that had the mindset 
for programming. And of course, these were these were the best and brightest of their accountants and planners and marketing people and telephone sanitizers. They they you know they took the best of them, the ones that felt like they could learn this skill. And again, these were old people. These weren't young. Okay? They weren't taking kids out of college. They were taking people in their 30s and 40s and 50s and teaching them how to program computers. This was a, a remarkable age, right? And by the way, about half of those programmers were women. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like it is today where 3% of the programmers are women. No, the, half of them were women. It was a very interesting time. Though not mathematicians, they were experienced, disciplined professionals. And I think, you know, I can't ask Alan Turing, but I think Turing would have approved of who these people were. But IBM was turning the crank fast. They were starting to produce IBM 360s. They started producing a thousand of those every month. What a beautiful machine this was. The IBM 360, there were a whole bunch of different models. Beautiful machines. You could get them with 16K. You could get them with 64K. You could get even bigger ones. I mean, these were really lovely machines. They could execute you know, 20, 30, 40,000 instructions a second. They had disk drives and tape drives. Beautiful machines, and boy, they had lights. Look at that front panel. Lights, there's lights on that front panel, and you could watch them blink. As the program executed, all those registers would blink, and if you were good, if you were really good, you could watch the pattern of lights on the computer and detect flaws in your running system. <laughs> but now the computers are everywhere. IBM was, was renting these to everybody and his brother. They, the client service bureau that I worked for had two of these machines. Uh, they had, they had a, 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 a 36040, which had 64K of core, and a 36030 that had 16K of core. And the 36030 had a switch setting on the front. You see those three switches down there at the bottom right? You could set those switches and turn the machine into a 1401 computer. It would emulate a 1401 computer, so you could run all of your old 1401 programs. It was remarkable. These guys, these IBM guys, were, were pretty on the ball. This was a cool era because in this era, most of the things that we consider relevant today happened. For example, uh, Ole Ohandal and Christian Nygaard were goofing around on in 1966, and they they uh, they took a data structure in the language Algol and they moved it from the stack to the heap, and they invented objects. Object-oriented design was invented, and they called it Simula. This new language they had created, Simula 67, the very first object-oriented language. Two people of note were Simula programmers. Alan Kay, who went on to invent Smalltalk, and Yarnis Strustrup, who went on to invent C++. So this was the moment when objects were invented, 1966. 1968 is the year that Dijkstra said, go to might not be such a great idea. And the whole regime of structured programming was born on that day. And by golly, you know, 1968, Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, goofing around on a PDP, what was it, a PDP-7 up on the some floor of Bell Labs. They'd gotten their, their project they were working on was Multics, and the project got canceled, and they were they were turned loose, and <laughs> they had nothing to do. So they went upstairs, and they found a little computer to hack around with. And a few weeks later, they had two things interesting running, C and Unix, <laughs> and they changed the world. <laughs> this, this was the era when really important things happened in software, objects, structured, C, Unix, all this fascinating stuff. But the cranks were turning faster and faster. Digital equipment had been born and by golly, they were making computers, little computers, teeny little computers that would fit on your desk. Oh my goodness, you see a PDP-8 sitting there. That's that big horky thing over to the left. That was actually built out of raw transistors, no integrated circuits in that thing. But by the time a year or two later, they were doing PDP-8Is and PDP-8Ss. You see that thing on the right, that's a PDP-8S. You could buy that PDP 8S with 4K of core, 12-bit words, for $10,000. I was like a junior in high school at the time, and my buddy and I dreamed, dreamed of getting $10,000 so that we could buy a PDP-S. <laughs> PDP 8S. We never did, by the way. 
<laughs> he never did. Now I've got a P P I D P eight back there, uh, and it's it's uh, it's got a uh, Raspberry Pi in it. That's why it, why it's running so well. But boy, we really wanted one of these things. Digital Equipment Corporation was making these in 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 immense numbers. There were fifty thousand PDP eights made. I don't know how many PDP elevens were made, but we're getting to a really interesting time now. We're now into the 70s, and the number of computers in the world is on the order of hundreds of thousands. <laughs> and it's, it's only, what, 25 years since, since Alan Turing, right? But there are hundreds of thousands of computers, and they're cheap. I mean, you know, $10,000 sounds expensive, but no, that's not expensive for what these machines did. And how many programmers were there? Well, there was still this 10 to 1 factor, although that was starting to change now. That was beginning to change now. A PDP-8 was cheap enough that you didn't have to have it running all the time. You could turn it off. Turn it on when you needed it. Turn it off when you didn't. You used a little bit of power, right? So turning it off probably made sense. So the ratio of programmers to computers was beginning to shift, but it hadn't quite shifted yet. So the number of programmers in the world was now in the millions on the order of millions. And who were they? Who were these programmers? Now, now, the timeline here is 25 years. And in 25 years, it looks like we went from one to millions of programmers. And who were they? Who were these programmers? Hundreds of thousands of computers, millions of programmers. Who were they? Well, here's one of them. That's me at age 18. And I was a programmer. I got my first job as a programmer at age 18. I didn't go to college because, you know, why would you go to college during the Vietnam War, for goodness sake? No, 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 no. I didn't go to college. I had taught myself Fortran and COBOL and PL1 by this time. I got myself a job at that client service bureau. I was a programmer then. And I was one of tens of thousands because the colleges now had computer science degree programs computer programming education was finally in the universities and everybody wanted to be a programmer. It was, it was, it was the thing to be because you knew you could make a lot of money. And, and something bizarre happened here because there were tens of thousands of CS and double E grads who were all going to become programmers and they all had something in common. We, I'll say we, because I was one of them, although I wasn't a grad, we were all young and we were almost all male. Something weird happened and it happened then and it, and it probably happened in the colleges because it was the grads coming out that were, for the most part, young men. At my first job, there were 24 programmers on the order of 24. I, I don't know the exact number. Most of them were in their 30s or 40s. Like I said, programmers at that time were kind of old, but half of them were women. And that was, that was, not, a, that was not surprising. It's like, you know, the, you'd look at the programming staff and there'd be a man and a woman and a man and a man and a woman and a woman and a man. It was just, you know, about half of them were women. 10 years later, by 1980, I was working at a different company that had about 50 programmers. And we were all in our 20s or early 30s and two of them were women. Something happened, some huge demographic shift. I don't know how, I don't know what the cause of it was, although you can look at that date and you can surmise that the, uh, the microcomputer and the personal computer were right around that time. Actually, the, the uh, Mac came out in 1983. The Apple II probably came out about right around 1980, right? So it's around the right time, although I think the demographic shift happened a little earlier. I think it happened in the mid 70s. This is a graph of the demographic shift and it's fascinating. You see the blue, the bluish green lines there? Those are the traces of women in technical degree programs, the physical sciences, law school, med school, things like that. And you can see, you know, that women are still very interested in those programs. The red line is computer science. And look what happened to it. I mean, it just collapsed. It, early on, women were just as interested, but all of a sudden, it just turned around and went on the floor. And it's not at all clear to me why. Now, 
the date that they that this graph says that happens is some somewhere around 1983 to 1985. I saw it much earlier than that. I think it was mid to late seventies when this happened. So I don't know why they're putting it out by 85, but okay, we may, we've got a disagreement by a few years, but, but we did see the same effect. And by the way, these traces are people um, entering degree programs. <laughs> this is not graduates, this is entering degree programs. And for some reason, women stopped entering computer science degree programs. The demographics of programming decisively shifted towards young men. For some reason, hundreds of thousands of very young men, which of course is typically not what Turing would have thought of as disciplined mathematicians of ability. <laughs> but businesses had to have programmers. And they had to get them from somewhere. And what they got was a whole bunch of young men coming out of school and what very young men might lack in discipline. They make up for with energy. <laughs> if you can channel that energy and what better way to channel that energy? <laughs> well, and they were also cheap. <laughs> now, you know, I got a job as a programmer when I was 18. $6,800 a year. I thought that was an infinite amount of money. Yeah. I was living at home at the time. It was enough for me to make car payments and go out to eat. I could get as much pizza as I wanted to eat and I could buy gasoline and I could make my car insurance payments and I car payment and live at home. And, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a great, it was a great amount of money for me. Uh, although, you know, not nowadays we wouldn't think of that as an awful lot, but for a young grad coming out of school, it's not bad, not bad. And by the way, salaries were just going crazy at that time. So it was not, it was not at all unusual to get a 12 or a 15% raise every year. This was the, the beginning of stagflation. Some of you will remember what that was. <laughs> the, the bad old days of 15% interest rates and things like that. Now, remember, up to this point, programmers had been disciplined professionals. They didn't need a lot of management. They knew how to manage their time and work together. They understood deadlines and commitments and what to leave in and what to leave out and all that Bob Seeger stuff running against the wind, right? They knew all that stuff, right? But now, now the ranks of programmers were being flooded with vastly energetic young men. The old guys, had worked miracles. Those first programmers, those first old, old guys that have been drawn from the, they did all kinds of stuff. They were the ones that built the virtual memory operating system for the IBM 360. These are the guys that put us on the moon. They did the Mercury and the Gemini and the Apollo space capsules. They invented structured programming, functional programming, object-oriented programming, Fortran, COBOL, Algol, Lisp, C and Unix. Those were the disciplined people who did all that stuff. Those original programmers knew how to get important things done. And if you'd watched them, you would have seen them use a process that today we would recognize as agile because <laughs> they worked in small iterations with lots of feedback. The Mercury Space Pack Capsule programmers wrote their unit tests in the morning and made them pass in the afternoon, some rudimentary form of test-driven development. But now hordes of young testosterone driven men were entering the field and they need discipline imposed upon them from above. They need some kind of close management and a fixed process. They need waterfall. <laughs> now, it's only what? What is that, 25 years? 25 years and waterfall has begun. <laughs> <laughs> and Waterfall stayed with us for 30 more years. And during that time, what was happening? The number of programmers in the world was exploding. I believe that the number of programmers doubles roughly every five years. I think it has been doubling once every five years since 1970. It was probably doubling faster than that before 1970. Uh, and that 
that implies something very bizarre. Uh, it implies that about half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. You can do the math on this if you want, but it's pretty straightforward math, right? I mean, if you have one programmer in 1945 and you think you've got maybe a hundred million now, you know, well, okay, what's, what's that growth curve? That's an ex exponential curve. So let's choose the exponent, right? Let the base of the exponent we will pick to be two. Okay, and uh, what is the exponent of two that's close to 100 million. Well, okay, two to the 10th is about a thousand. So two to the 20th is about a million. And two to the seventh is about a hundred, it's 128. So, okay, two to the 27th. That means there's been 27 doublings between 1945 and today. 75 years, 27 doublings. Now that's a little, um, little more than two years per doubling. <laughs> And I think in those early years, it doubled much faster than that and then slowed down to about once every five years. So I think that's what's going on now. The number of programmers in the world doubles every five years, <laughs> even today. Now that can't stay. We can't keep doing that. There's, there's not that many doublings left from 100 million to 8 billion, right? There's only a few doublings left. So at some point that rate's gonna have to slow down, but it doesn't show any sign of slowing down yet. And it's not ridiculous to think that 20 years from now, 10% of the, of the workforce will be imp information workers of some kind. 10% yeah. of the workforce could be related to programming somehow. That's not ridiculous to think. In 1995, uh, the waterfall spell was broken. A bunch of us got together at Snowbird and we started to think, you know, guys, we need we need to do something about this. We actually we got together in, in the University of Illinois at first. The patterns movement began down there and and uh, we started a bunch of ideas like extreme programming and scrum. And then we got together at Snowbird in 2000 and we thought this whole waterfall thing has to break. We've got to get out of this waterfall mindset. And uh, yeah, a bunch of this stuff like, you know, Scrum was invented by Schwaber and Beadle and DeVoe and extreme programming was invented by Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham and Pete Code did feature driven development and Alistair Coburn did Crystal and there was this, all this activity from about 1995 on right that was starting to explore again this idea of working in short cycles with lots of feedback and it all culminated of course with the meeting at Snowbird in 2001 where we, we did the Agile Manifesto. And, and you know, that was, that was just a meeting of a bunch of guys. You know, that's all it was. You know, we, we sent out an invitation to a whole bunch of people. Martin Fowler and I did that. We, we sent out this, meet, this invitation to a whole bunch of people. Uh, men and women both. We, you know, we had a fairly broad uh, invitation list. And, and uh, Alistair Coburn chimed in and said, hey, I was going to call the same meeting. I've got other people I'd like to invite. And, and he added his invitation list in. 17 people showed up, right? And, and they were all old white men. We invited other people, but only the old white men showed up. That was just the way of it. Uh, and we had this meeting at Snowbird. And, uh, you know, it was just a meeting. It was, it was the kind of meeting that you have every once in a while. You don't really expect anything to come of it. You really don't, right? And we wrote a little manifesto and we went back. And Ward Cunningham said, as we were leaving, he said, I'm going to put this up on a website and I'm going to write a little thing that'll let people sign it. And tens of thousands of people started signing this thing. Like, we didn't know that was going to happen. We figured we were going to go home and you know, maybe some people would talk about it for a little while, but that would be the end of it. And no, tens of thousands of people people uh, signed this thing. This is a picture of the website. And you, you can see us there. This was actually a picture taken uh, at the time. Ward took the picture. There's Martin Fowler. There's Martin. You can see Martin right there. He's up at the board. And, and this is um, this, uh, uh, Dave Thomas, the Prag, Prag Dave Thomas. And this, I think, is Jim Highsmith right there. This is me. <laughs> you know, but never mind all that. This, that was just that. And here's the Agile Manifesto, you know, the, the, uh, the four famous lines, individuals and interactions over process and tools and all of that stuff. And that's where that all came from. And on and on and on it went. Oh, my goodness. 
Um, let's see, I want to get to this point here. What I've been walking through for the last hour is the history. And I took us up to the year 2000. We could go a little further. I could talk about a little more of it, but I want to make a point. And here's the point. We programmers do not have a profession. It's been 75 years and we still don't have a profession. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that there is nothing that we profess. There are no disciplines that we profess. Alan Turing said we were going to need disciplines, but there are none that we profess, not as, a, not as an industry. There are no ethics that we profess. There are no um, uh, standards that we profess. We, programmers, have no profession. Now, you might object to that and say, well, you know, I, I have ethics, I have standards, I write code. Yes, okay, fine. But as an industry, we do not have anything that we profess in common. And we'd better get something pretty soon because our society nowadays depends on, on computers and on software for its existence. If all the computers stopped today, civilization would stop as well. There is nothing you can do in our society without interacting with a software system. I mean, you want a microwave, a hot dog. There's a software system in that microwave. You want to know what time it is. You've got a software system in your watch. You want to call your significant other. There's a really sophisticated software system in your phone. You want to drive to the store. There's an immense software system running in your car. You can't buy anything. You can't sell anything. You can't get insurance. You can't file a claim. No law can be passed. No law can be enforced. No government policy can be instated without software being smack in the middle of it all. And there's no profession governing that software. Civilization is sitting on top of this software, this massive wad of software written by people who do not have a profession. And that's not stable. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the recipe for a disaster. And there's the disaster heading straight for us. You, you know it's coming, right? You know that some guy, some programmer, He's going to do some dumb thing. It doesn't even have to be that dumb, but it'll kill 10,000 people in one shot. You know that's going to happen. Think of the 737 max, you know. That wasn't 10,000 people, but it was it was a good 5 600. <laughs> it's not that far from, you know, 10,000 people. And when that occurs, when that occurs, the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation because they won't be able to tolerate the idea that the software their whole civilization depends upon is, <laughs> is corrupt. So they will rise up in righteous indignation and they will point their finger right at us. And they will ask us the obvious question, how could you have let this happen? And you might think they're gonna point your, their finger at your boss you might think they're going to point their finger at your employer, but that's not what's going to happen. Did anybody watch the testimony of the, uh, the CEO of Volkswagen North America as he was hauled before Congress to explain why the software in the Volkswagen was cheating the, the Environmental Protection Agency machines in California? Did anybody watch that? And they, they asked him the question, how could you have let this happen? And he said, and I quote, well, it was just a couple of software developers who did it for whatever reason. That finger's coming right at us, <laughs> one way or the other. And it should, because it's our fingers on the keyboard. We're the ones writing that code. And they're going to ask us the question. And the question's going to be, how could you have let this happen? How could you have been so negligent that 10,000 people are now dead? And we, if, if our answer to that is, <laughs> well... Yeah, my boss told me it had to be done on Tuesday. If that is our answer, then, then the politicians of the world will do what they must. You know, they, will, they will legislate software. They will tell us 
what languages we can use and what platforms we can use and what frameworks we can use, what processes we have to follow, what courses we have to take, what books we have to read, and we'll all wind up working for the post office. Do you know how close we came in 2013? That was the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, one of the Ask one of the laws within the Affordable Care Act was that there would be a software system up and running on October 1st, 2013. Now, never mind the fact that setting a date certain for a software system is really stupid. Never mind that. They turned it on. They turned it on. <laughs> and it wasn't ready. There had to be programmers hiding under their desks going, oh my God, they're going to turn it on, aren't they? Yeah, I think they just turned it on. Oh, my God. There had to be programmers just, you know, waiting for the fallout. And, of course, the fallout came. And for a brief time, the Obama administration considered a cabinet position called the CTO of the United States of America. That scared the hell out of me. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. But it came close. It will happen. One of these days, it's going to happen. And you and I have to be ready for that. We have to be ready with a set of standards, a set of ethics, a set of disciplines that we all agree to and follow. And how that's going to happen, I don't know. But it's going to have to happen, and probably reasonably soon. Now, one of those disciplines that I think would be good were, would be test-driven development. Another one I think would be refactoring. Another one I think would be simple design. In fact, I think you could take all of the practices of extreme programming, all of the disciplines that was written about by Kent Beck 20 years ago. And I think you could wrap that up into a nice little bow and say, you know, these are the disciplines. These disciplines are good disciplines. Continuous deployment, right? Continuous integration. These are good disciplines. We should all have these disciplines. That might be a good idea. I don't know how it's going to happen. I do know it's going to have to happen. I hope that it is not forced upon us by from above. But with that, it's probably a good idea to end this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. This is one I really enjoy giving because it's fun to talk about the history of software and where it might be going. And of course, it's important, I think, to realize that, you know, you and I better do something about what's going on. Um, pretty soon, because this this disaster that we are facing is certainly, certainly looming. Anyway, thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day in this bizarre COVID era that we're living in. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain them now, if, uh, if we have the mechanism for questions. <laughs> we, we should. Um, people should be just able to unmute. Okay. Well, if you got a question, you can unmute yourself and holler it out. I, I actually have a question. Please. So I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on like how this might intersect with some of the professional organizations that do exist, like ACM or IEEE. Well, I have some hope for that. I, those those organizations do seem to want to have a um, uh, a, a set of standards but they have not been particularly decisive about that. You know, they, they have an oath, but the oath is kind of um, um, ma, ma, motherhood and apple pie kind of, kind of oath. It's not anything very specific. And I think what we need is something much more specific. You know, I, think, I think we need a set of disciplines. I think we need a set of standards that are very well articulated and written out and I don't think the ACM and the IEEE are, are interested in doing that, at least not right now. I had some hopes that the Agile Alliance would do that, but I don't, I don't think they want to either. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know where that's going to go. One of the possibilities is that companies will do it. Uh, there are companies already that, that have professional standards for their software developers, and they articulate them and they write them. And it, and it may be that many developers will be attracted to those kinds of companies. And then there could be a competition in the, in the marketplace at large. You know, which of these companies 
does the best job. Oh, you know, they've got a set of standards. They're doing a great job. Maybe we will hire them. Maybe it'll be something like that, almost like a guild approach. So I don't know, but I'd like to see something happen. <laughs> I have a yeah, comment. Right. Comment. Um, okay. You had, you had mentioned uh, that if we don't watch out, the government will step in and start mandating things. Yes. Sadly, that's happened going back as far as eight years ago, specifically in the medical records business. They uh, invented something called meaningful use and demanded that all, all creators of medical record software become certified. And uh, the certification should only cost you about a million and a half dollars. <laughs> and the best part is you get it. You have to do it every two years. You have to recertify your record system every two years. Is this a certification uh, of the system or a certification of the programmers? The the meaningful use had a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, programs. One of which was you needed you needed to use certified medical record software. Okay, software, but not programmers. You did not uh, have to use certified medical record programmers. Right, but they uh, they did they did enforce use of protocols and, and that sort of okay. thing, which is one thing you mentioned. And okay. um, all that law that lot what that what that change did like eight years ago was really cripple the small software companies that were. There were thousands. There were dozens and thousands of uh, small medical record companies. They're all all but gone now. So it's only the major players uh, that are that, that had the money or the resources to get those certifications. I have to think uh, that was part of the intent. Yeah. Oh, well, they had basically admitted it after they were <laughs> after they got beat up over it. Um, uh, and, and, and you know, in pure government fashion, they didn't. The government didn't do the certification. They hired third-party entities to do the certification. That's one of the things I'm afraid of because you can yeah. you can guess what third party they bring in to tell right. us what languages we can use. Yeah. Well, it, we're almost we're almost using a technology right now. The Zoom. Think about the publicity they had a few months ago uh, yeah. with all the security breaches. Yeah. And yeah. now they're we we were just started out the call talking about how popular it is and what their market cap was and stuff like that. It actually kind of worked out for them in a weird way where they started out uh, with some flaws but uh, gained a lot of market share and then got the money to fix them. They actually acquired another company in order to fix them. Hey Bob, there was a question I, I had that kind of goes back in a, a period of maybe mid 90s or so back when you had kind of the whole Jakobson, Booch, Ramba, you know, period going on, you know, with the modeling languages and things like that. And we went through that period, oh, there was, you know, still a waterfall going on. We went through that period where we had design as we knew it at that time with diagramming. Yeah. And other facts that were diagrams. And it seems to be when you go to something today, we're in these small increments. I find many programmers don't take the time to diagram. It's enough to capture in their heads. And then over a period of time, this thing builds and builds and builds. And there's no artifacts of diagrammatic things that we used to, I say, used to do. Maybe I, I'd like to know what does that kind of look like? Because I'd love to see some of that come back. Uh, in some shapes of form, it's if it's throwaway diagrams, because I know people when I mention diagrams, well, we don't want to keep up on those. I'm saying diagram just enough to go with it. And then we've got a collection of something that comes about. But it's an interesting thing because uh, it almost seems to be the industry kind of, well, I don't want to be keeping up on diagrams. But yet when somebody leaves with everything in their head, then the sky is falling and everything. There's a balance there. Do you have thoughts around this? It's an interesting dynamic going on there. I do. Uh, it is something that I teach. You know, I, I teach people that you know using diagrams is a is a great tool. I like them to be throwaway ish. You know, I don't want to have some great big book of diagrams. But you know, drawing diagrams on a whiteboard is a great idea. Um, keeping some uh, high level diagrams that give you a roadmap of the system is not a bad idea. Um, I, I certainly don't want, you know, three months of upfront diagram drawing and, and then have the code derived from that. But there's nothing wrong with having a, 
uh, a pictorial de um, depiction of the system that people can look at and follow. And it's certainly very helpful in the throes of design. If you can sketch something on the board and if you have a, a diagramming language that you can use to help you with that sketch. I use a very attenuated form of UML. I, I capture just a few of the, the UML gestures. I don't use the whole wad, you know, that they put together, uh, what, 20 years ago. But, but, you know, there are a couple of those, of those diagrams that I think are very useful. So when I'm out at customer sites or if I'm talking to people or doing a class, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging them to use that technique as a brainstorming technique. Bob, could you kind of touch on the program results that you put together and how that plays into your talk? Well, about um, three, four years ago, I um, I wrote a uh, an oath. It was kind of a, a takeoff on the Hippocratic Oath. And I came up, I think it was with nine points. If you want to see it, it's on my blog. It's blog.cleancoder.com, and you'll see the uh, the programmer's oath there. Uh, and there were nine points there, and they're roughly modeled after the disciplines of extreme programming. Um, not quite that they go a little bit in different directions, but you you you'll identify them in there if you if you read it. And I thought I offered that out as a kind of sample for what a programmer's oath might look like. Uh, and you know, it got a little bit of a little bit of stir for a while, and people looked at it and. And then everybody kind of went back and ignored it. And I, I, that's kind of what I expected anyway. I'm actually going to write a book about it. <laughs> so I'm working on a book now. And then the next book I write will be a book on the programmer's oath. Well, cool. We should probably wrap up soon. Um, any other last minute questions? When you, when you first talked about the, uh, um, the programmers or the, uh, you know, standards or whatever it kind of i thought of the three laws of robotics you know as most laws. <laughs> so yeah yeah first don't let anybody die and then you know try not to let them die or let it let somebody else die with it but maybe you can adapt those well the the uh the do no harm piece from the hippocratic oath certainly takes on a whole different set of dimensions in software land it's like yes what is harm? <laughs> what is harm? Is is it not getting it done today, or is it not making it maintainable uh, five years from now? You know, there's a there's a, always a trade off. So, or is it a weapon system? Does that cause harm? <laughs> <laughs> Thou shall not shoot harm? thyself. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thanks. Yeah. It's a lot of fun for me. I love doing this kind of stuff. Great presentation, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.